Basam, uh, first of all, a warm welcome to you on Film Me, Show Me. I think last time we spoke as well, and it was wonderful to kind of uh, catch you at the BFI London Film Festival. And now Mogul Mowgli is set for a theatrical release. I mean, it's your first feature film. And obviously it's very different from the other works that you've done before. So were you ever intending on making a film which is kind of based on the backdrop of rap music within the British Asian diaspora? <laughs> I never saw it that way. That's so funny. I was like, oh, wow, I guess we did do that. This is so funny, right? Like, it's, it's like you could, like, you could dissect this film in so many different ways. I always saw it as a father and son thing. And the guy was just kind of, and, and, I like, and I like rap. But I think it was only when I was in London, I realized, like, oh, my God, there's so much work and so much cultural literacy that, that I don't have. So, you know, like, we, we were blessed with an incredible music supervisor, Abdullah Wali, who just kind of schooled me. Riz was schooling me. So many people were just so generous in, in teaching me. And I felt like I just had to be honest and not act like I knew everything. Like, I knew nothing about, I didn't know anything about grime. I didn't know anything about garage. And I just sat there and I learned. I learned from these people. I learned about the Bhangra scene. I learned about, you know, all the stuff that was going on. And also where Riz f- f- falls into that scheme of things, you know, so... It, it was cool. It was really cool to, to see and to kind of build the character of Zed um, there as well. Yeah. Mm. And I think it's really interesting as well, like you mentioned, it is essentially a father-son narrative um, in a way of how uh, perhaps a father's fear and uh, a father's um, deep-rooted fear rather of partition and how that somewhat brushes onto the son as well is something that we kind of see. And normally in British Asian uh, films like uh, Mogul Mowgli, um, there's often a very tyrannical father who's almost like the antagonist, who's very misogynistic, who's basically Ompuri from East to East, to give a reference, basically. Um, but here it's a bit more sensitive and it's a lot more human. How important is it to see such stories, um, given the fact that the whole idea of masculinity and the whole idea of uh, father-child dynamics is changing nowadays? Yeah, man. Oh, like that, that was massive to us. That was massive to us. The funny thing is that I never saw East is East uh, until recently. And I remember everyone raved about it. So then, we, so then I finally watched it before we made this film. And I was like, I get it. Like, it was, it's, it's brutal. It's a, like, it's super brutal that sort of these de- de- depictions. And, um, and I, don't, I don't ever want to deny some of these experience with, with how, you know, with, with the truth of whoever their father was and how they were in their life. But for, for, for me and for my experience with my dad, it was never like that. Like he's never, and even with Riz with his father, there was never really a disapproval of our career choice. It was always a feeling of them being abandoned, right? That we kind of abandoned them and kind of left them. And right. I think that is really what we wanted to kind of explore. And also this kind of um, insecurity we, own, we have with the baggage of our families, even though so much of who we are and the tokenizing we do of ourselves, right? Like it's kind of, it's actually quite nuanced. It's, I think you probably get it more in where it's like, we will write about Bollywood, we will write about this stuff. Like, you know, it's like, it's funny, like I haven't even shown the parents, I haven't even shown my parents the film yet. Like, I'm so afraid. But it's wow. also like, there's, there's like this fear, not, not even a fear of like what they would think of it, but more like, it's so close to us, right? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm still embarrassed of, of it, right? Like, and mm. um, it's a process, right? Like, I feel like I'll never say that, like I've come around to it and I finally understand it, but I'm, but I'm constantly like confronting my own embarrassments with my own heritage, with my own lineage. and even though so much of the attention that's given to Riz and myself is because we are from the diaspora, right? We're right. South Asian and all that stuff. So we're like the hot commodity and all that. And we cash in on it, right? We cash in on it. That's just what we're doing. But, yeah. you know, but, but are we really being true to it? Are we really being true to our families? And, and I think that's a constant battle. It's never like mm-hmm. just one answer, you know? I really found it fascinating with the way a beautiful, uh, form like Kavali um, is portrayed in this very foreboding way. Um, the, I think the guy in the Sahara who keeps referencing Toba Tek Singh, which is obviously, um, uh, which was obviously, I think, a song uh, written by Riz as well. I think he's actually done a song called Toba Tek Singh too, I believe. Um, and I think it was just so fascinating to see all of that, the way you kind of used that as a very foreboding character. And it was almost, he was almost conflicted between um, you know, his sense of identity in many, many ways as well. Is this something that you also feel in your life? I mean, given that response that I just heard from you, is this something that you kind of really resonate with the most, which is why you were able to give that extra kind of personal touch to Mogul Mogi? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that the, the, the portrayal of Kowali in the music in the film, you're right, it's got this kind of foreboding kind of uh, feeling. Man, that's, you really nailed it, image. And I think 
the thing is, so, so Toba Text Singh is also, it's actually, originally it was based on a short story written by Salvat Hassan Manto. Of course, who, yes. Um, about partition and how yeah. there was a person that was like, well, I'm from Toba Text Singh. And then, you know, basically they, they, they all started calling him like, you know, this guy named Bishan Singh who thinks that yes. he's from this place and that's where it is, but nobody knows where Toba Text Singh is. So instead of going to Pakistan or India, he ends up standing in the middle and he goes, I'm here. This is Toba Text Singh. And he was a and mental, man's like, he was in a mental yes. asylum as well. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the whole question is, like, is well, this mental patient who is Hindu or, or Sikh, sorry, he's Sikh, does he actually go to, to India or does he go to Pakistan, right? So he doesn't know where to go. And he's like, well, I'm from Toba Tech Singh. So he basically is this, and, and it's, yeah. it's an incredible, I mean, it's hilarious, but it's also sad, it's tragic. But, mm-hmm. but I think we used, we, we always felt pulled to that short story. And I think Liz's song, Toba Tech Singh, was yeah. always kind of an exciting element of like, let's, let's, you know, I always knew that we wanted to build to that as a final thing. Um, what I would say about the foreboding element of Kowali, man, it's like, <sighs> I grew up listening to so much Kowali. Like I grew up in the age of like Musul Fateli Khan, you wow. know, in the nineties and, you know, like was, was always playing in my house. And um, I never connected to it, right? So I never knew how to, how to connect to it. So I think the idea of, you know, of, of Toba Tech seeing this character in our film, having a Sahara on his face, was almost this idea of like there's there's this disconnection that we have with our own heritage, you know, and that, that yeah. I feel like, you know, Zed is having, and we're never we're not we're not given that bridge to how do we connect to this material, you know? Right. It's always a bit messy. You know, um, there were certain elements um, when it came to the horror part of things, when it came to that part where I think there's that scene where Zed uh, is at his dad's restaurant and I think the whole Kavali thing is going on and everyone's dancing and then it all becomes a bit mad and, and I think his dad is telling everyone to get out and stuff like that. that that whole sequence and stuff and other other sort of sequences that you do they're very very beautifully done in terms of the cinematic experience is so fantastic at some places it kind of reminded me of Stanley Kubrick in, in certain places as well um, what would you say is your influence in cinema in bringing out certain sequences which are rather abstract? Um, yeah, I think uh, it, you know, like I think, um, so yeah, my cinematic influences, man, that's a great question. I would say that like, uh, there, there's a few filmmakers that I love, like one is Tarkovsky, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. Um, I love Bresson, I love his uh, very austere filmmaking, but also very deeply spiritual, outlook on life and I felt there was something very austere very you know very sparse about our film and I wanted to also kind of look at Sabah Hassan Mundo's writing as kind of how we were filming the movie and and we wanted to kind of give it a very quiet feeling right because so then the moments where it does explode we really feel it right which is kind of very similar to also Kawali where in a way the film follows a very Kawali framework where things explode and then there are moments of silence and moments of dissonance and then, you know, and this dissonance, you know, comes to another crescendo and it comes down again and then it's got these little crescendo moments. So there's almost an element of Kawali that we were looking at as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I will also say that Carlos Regadas is a filmmaker that I love. Uh, You know, he did Post Tenebrous Locks, um, which was this really, you know, deeply divisive film, but, but, but had a really great way of like creating associative you know, like, you know, stories and moments and, and how it all came together really nicely, I think, towards the end. I think um, he's somebody that I look at as well. Also because I think it's it's about social urgency in his work, which which I think I, I really connected to. You know, of course, like, the you know, the the Iranian masters, like, I think Abbas Kiarostami is somebody that I love. Yeah. Um, I love, uh, oh my God, I forgot her name, but, but there's this film called The Day I Became a Woman, which was which is another Iranian film, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. Majid Majidi is fab as well, to be honest. I like the way yeah, he presents yeah. humanized narratives uh, through ordinary characters, I think is great. But I think what I, I'm really fascinated by is the emergence of rap in cinema. I mean, I think we spoke about this as well last time I, I, I met you as well. Um, we spoke about Gully Boy. And I think you mentioned that it was consciously uh, a decision for you not to have a rather happy, happy ending. Like how Gully Boy Murad ends up performing um, you know, at at at, a, at the concert, you know, but here we just basically see Zed making amends with his father, and his father kind of just reassuring him that you know it's all good in the hood, basically. So, I mean, was that a conscious decision for you to not make it um, a rather happy, happy ending? 
you know, it's, uh, it's really, it, it's something that, yeah, like, so, so we spoke about last time was really how Murad, I loved Gully Boy, but, but I found, I found the, the, the ending for me just was a bit troubling because here, uh, we, there's this capitalistic myth that if you work really hard, it pays off in the end. And I think that that is horseshit because it doesn't work like that in, in the real world. In the I real know. world, it, it's not it's not like you work really hard and then it pays off. It's like, no, there's luck involved. There's a cosmic thing that will happen that, that'll make something happen. But it's not you work really hard and then you'll be successful. It's like, no, 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 no. And I think to show how you have to measure success with things that you can control in your own life. And really what that means to me is like, and I guess it's a spoiler. So, you know, don't like, you should watch the film before, you know, you hear this interview, but, um, and maybe you can make a note of that, please. But, but, but yeah. it's like, but it's like it's Zed allowing his father into the bathroom is really this moment of like, I'm allowing you into my life and I'm allowing us to come together to make this, this track something else and, right. and make it ours. Right. And that's what it becomes about. And I think that to me is, is really the victory that, that we have to start looking for in our life. It's really the everyday daily victories that we can win with each other and, you know, not some larger thing of like, you know, cause like, yeah, there was a version of this where it's like, it ends with him on stage and he's like, wow. And he's singing the song with RPG and they're both really happy and he's fully cured. And then he like, you know, but it's like, that just doesn't, it, it's, it's just not the, the reality of life. You know, it's not how things really work. You know, I find it really fascinating. So I'm not sure if you've seen this Bollywood film called Tamasha with Ranbir and Deepika, but I think um, Zed's character kind of reminds me of Ranbir's character a little bit, Ved in Tamasha. Like he too was kind of conflicted um, in many, many ways, you know, about the sense of identity, you know, kind of like um, his was more between profession and personal life choices of what he wants to do. But I guess it was very similar action. I kind of liked the whole idea. And I think what's even interesting, again, is the fact that, you know, usually we see masculine characters being portrayed as like these dominant characters in British Asian films. But here we see one who is a bit vulnerable and it's very unapologetic in showcasing that vulnerability. And I think that is a sign of progression as well. But why do you think this whole kind of, uh, you know, regressive portrayals have been happening? I mean, what do you think is the way forward now? Yeah, I think man like yeah like i'm I'm obsessed with fragile masculinity right like like, like yeah. that's like i think so much of my work deals with that ghost of sugarland these birds walk the magambo video i did with riz like it's literally just about <laughs> different like gazes of masculinity and men and you know yeah. and, and mogul Mo i mean mogul mogli is literally a culmination of, of all those ideas of masculinity and um and i'm also just like i i find i find that to be really important in my work um because I think okay, okay. I'll I'll say that like that regressive stuff. Um, I, I haven't seen Tamasha, so I can't speak to I, I can't speak to Tamasha. But what I would say is like, but 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 I think I think the reason why we don't we, we're not vulnerable is because we have a lot of masks to keep on. But like okay, generally what we have is a culture of when anyone makes it right, like that that's like a celebrity or whatever, they end up feeling they have to represent so much of people and this and that and i think that that's really hard to put on one person you know and, yeah. and people then look to them and, and i think that that's what keeps people from actually being vulnerable or the vulnerability becomes a performance that i think is quite caged and very like this is me without my instagram filter kind of stuff but yeah but i, but I think true vulnerability is really searching and exploring along and i think that was something that i find i really was inspired by riz where Mm. where I saw him really go, you know, head, head first into this character and mm. then not know where we were going to go. And I didn't know where we were going to go. And I think sometimes us admitting to each other that we don't know where we're going is really, I think, the, you know, the, the coup in all this is just us being honest with each other. And I right. think continue to build with one another is also, I think, the thing that I'm excited about. It's not just this being like a one-off, but us kind of realizing that in order for us to grow is we kind of need each other. It's not just a solo journey of me and a solo journey of Riz and we came together, but it's like, no, we need to continue to come together to build. Absolutely. But on a final note, uh, Bassam, after making a very trailblazing film like Mogul Mowgli, um, what are your plans next? I mean, what sort of work and what style of narratives would you like to explore further? I want to explore aunties. That's what I want to do next. Aunties? 
I love aunties and oh, I'm God. in Texas. So yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just want to do some auntie stuff now. So yeah, I mean, like I want to do something about my mom. So oh wow, that's I'm working out. Yeah, that'll so. be really interesting. As soon as you mentioned aunties, I just kept thinking of the three ladies in Kalhonaho. For some reason, that's the only thing. That's <laughs> I was like, wow, yeah. a biopic on them. How cool would that be? Like an origin <laughs> of the aunties. Yeah. But that'd be really interesting. I think that would be that would be very uh, an interesting subject after exploring fragile masculinity. Maybe something about femininity <laughs> as well. I think would be very interesting. Yeah. Kind of see. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> well, sounds fantastic. But Basam, as always, it's always so good to catch up with you. And um, um, yeah, really... likewise, man. Thank you. I love your questions. They're so thoughtful, and you're so reflective. You. You're like, you're 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 a real like. Yeah, it's just it's just so great. It's great to be chatting again too. Lovely. Well, hopefully it won't be the last time for sure. I'm sure I can't wait to uh, catch up with you for your next projects and uh, wishing yeah, you all the very best for Mogul Mowgli and whatever else you have lined up, especially regarding the aunties. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Basam. Thank you.